I'm going to talk to you today about a guy in the scriptures. His name is Lazarus. Turn with me over to the book of John. John chapter 11. It's in the New Testament. We're going to read a good portion of scripture, 38 through 45. John chapter 11, verses 38 through 45. The title of the message is A Portrait of Process. The Portrait of Process. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been there four days. Verse 40, Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. For Jesus looked up and said, Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of those standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Verse 43, and when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Verse 45, therefore... Many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Lord, help us as we study this passage. I want to talk about three things with relate, related to this scripture reading. One, what it means to come out. The other, what it means to come to. And thirdly, what it means to go out. Come out, come to, and go out. Lazarus was a good friend of Jesus. He had two sisters, Mary and Martha. They lived in a town called Bethany. Bethany was about two miles away from Jerusalem. So even though they they didn't call it this, it was a suburb. You could walk there in about 30 to 45 minutes. They were supporters of Christ's ministry. They would be the people who would, in an impromptu way, host 15 to 20 folks when they came to their house, meaning Jesus would just show up. Remember, no telephone, no text, no email. You just kind of knocked on the door and said, hi, we're here. And hospitality of the Middle East was that whatever you had, you gave to people who showed up at your door. It wasn't like you could have gave us some notice, bro. No, 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 no. Welcome. And Mary and Martha were the ones who would do most of the hospitality, which meant that not only did they support the ministry of Christ, but if they were going to go ahead and and serve 12 disciples, Jesus, and some others who were considered just folks who tagged along, you might be talking about 20 people who just showed up and said, "I'm I'm hungry, I want some food. They had a large house. And Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were well known enough that if you look in the prior passages in the chapter of uh, of 11 in, in John, it says that, Many people from Jerusalem came out to give their condolences regarding Lazarus. So they were a prominent family in the Jewish community. And they had resources, and they used those resources for the kingdom. And they were some of the few that really believed in Jerusalem now, really believed that Jesus Christ was exactly who he said he was. Now remember, Jerusalem is the capital, but it is not Christ's home. He lived 90 miles north. He did most of his ministry up in Galilee. Jerusalem is in the south. He would come to Jerusalem for the feasts. The Jews were required to come to Jerusalem, wherever they were around the world, three times a year for the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths. Jesus would come to Jerusalem for those. They'd stay an entire week, and sometimes he'd stay a little bit longer because (laughs) revival broke out. Folks started getting right with God. But for the most part, it was problematic when he came to Jerusalem. It wasn't that everybody would just say, oh, you're wonderful. I want to follow you. Most people would say, you are upsetting the status quo here. We've got a way we like to do religion, and it is not your way. Stop what you're saying. Stop what you're doing and go back home. That's the way they treated Jesus, mostly in Jerusalem. So if you followed him, you were in danger of being treated the same way. 
There were a couple of times that they wanted to go ahead and stone him, kill him. Jerusalem was not a favored place for the disciples or Jesus, though it was the capital of the Jewish people and a place that should receive him, but would not because of envy, because of power struggles, and because they had an idea about how their life ought to be, and Jesus wrecked it. He was the guy who turned on the lights in the club at 2 a.m. <laughs> Nobody likes that guy. I mean, he didn't, even, he didn't even do it on purpose. He was just sitting on the wall, and he was jamming in the music, and all of a sudden his shoulder hit the light and said, Hey, hey, what are you doing? Bro, turn the light off. You show everybody's dirt. Everybody do them wrong, and nobody wants anybody to see. Jesus was that guy, but intentional. Pop. They wanted their dirt hidden. They liked their dirt. I say all that to say that Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were taking a risk. They were following Jesus, and they were supporting him. They loved him. They were arguably his finest supporters, and some of his best friends. Word comes in the early part of John chapter 11 that the one you love is sick, Lazarus. Mary and Martha had sent word to Jesus. He's not doing good. No, you, you don't send word to Jesus about being sick if you got a cold. You just get over it. <laughs> this is serious. The one you love is sick. The disciples hear about it. They think, oh, surely Jesus is going to show up. This is the man who cares about him most. He's laid down his reputation in all of Jerusalem for his benefit. He gives him money. He opens up his house. Surely Jesus is going to get up and in a hurry. Okay, guys, pack up. We're going to go. Jesus says, eh, let's stay here for a couple of minutes. This is not a sickness unto death. And the disciples said, this is how he treats his friends? <laughs> The man who has the power to change anything is deciding not to. Wow. Come on, Bishop. You know, we, we sometimes blame God for being neglectful. We hardly talk about him doing wrong because we know he's morally right, all right. But we as believers, and especially unbelievers, folk who don't know, bend toward the idea easily that he could have done better. Why didn't he show up? Why didn't he help? If he really loves, he ought to fix that. If he's really a, a caring God, why doesn't he address that? This is where the disciples were. This is where Mary and Martha were because Lazarus was their brother. And in support of, of Jesus' ministry, all these 12 realized, that guy, I cashed a check from him last week. <laughs> he supports all of us, and you're not going to help him out? When you don't have anything else to do, it's not like you're pressed. He just said, we're going to stay here a couple of more days. And they're thinking, this is how you love this is how you love. They would not have sent word to you if it were not an emergency. This is how you love? Be careful. There is nobody who loves you more than God. There's nobody who loves you better than God. And we are the last people that should talk about whether he loves us because we don't like his timing or the way he's doing what he's doing. He knows better. And much of what happens in the earth is people's fault, not his. When it's wrong, it's because we're wrong. And rather than trying to figure out, God, where were you? I asked folk, well, where were you? You said something bad happened. What did you do about it? Why weren't you there to intervene? How do you fix stuff that's wrong? Do you watch the news and just say, oh, that's terrible. If you've got the power to do something, why don't you step up? We're always blaming him. He said it was not a sickness unto death, though Lazarus would die. But what he meant was this. He said right. He didn't say wrong. It's not a sickness unto permanent death. That's what he meant. 
there's something other that I'm going to do that's bigger than whatever you think I'm not doing. Watch and wait. This is going to be amazing. You're going to be depressed. All y'all going to be mad at me, but it's going to be good in the end. It's going to be good. They didn't understand a thing. Not a thing. He shows up on day four. Now, day four, Lazarus has been in the grave for four. So somehow or another, when he was sick, was probably two or three days before he died. Jesus waited almost a week. And there was a superstition in the Jewish community that it's, it's possible that if you don't wait until four days, that somebody can have a, a reanimated moment in the grave, but not after four days. So Jesus made sure he waited long enough whereby the superstition would not arise. He shows up. He's not even in the city yet, but on the outskirts, people realize he's coming. Martha hears about it. They're all weeping, mourning. The throng of people who are lamenting over Lazarus' death are many. From Jerusalem, from Bethany, everybody is just depressed and forlorn. Martha runs out to meet him and says, Lord, if you had just been here, my brother would not have died. What is she really saying but, but being polite? It's your fault. It's your fault. Jesus said, ah, okay. If you believe, you'll see the glory of God. For I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will not die. Oh, I know who you say you are, who you are, and I believe it. And, 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 and we, I will see you. I'll, I'll be resurrected in the last day. We, we believe you. So she gets religious because she doesn't want to disagree with Jesus, but her soul is conflicted because she is mad at him, <laughs> disappointed with him, so discouraged with the fact that they have given so much, and he did not even take the time to come to the funeral, wow. much less try to raise him from the dead or make him, make him well. She realizes, I'm, I'm getting nowhere with him. She goes back home, and she talks to Mary. She said, the master wants to see you. I don't know whether Jesus said that, but I think she thought that if I couldn't get any place with him, maybe you can, because he seems to like you a little bit more than he likes me. Backstory to that in Luke. You have to read it for yourself. <laughs> Mary comes out and says the same thing. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus realizes, I'm not going to be able to help these folk until I help Lazarus. So very little conversation happens with Mary. And he goes to the tomb. And while he's there, we have what is the shortest verse in all of Scripture. It says that Jesus wept. Now, I'm not quite sure why he wept. But I have some 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 feelings as to why he wept. If you know that you're about to fix everybody's issues, you generally don't cry for the person who's going to receive the greatest blessing. Why would you weep for that? Everybody interpreted the fact that he was weeping because he loved Lazarus so well. Oh, he loved him so much. And now he's, in, he's enjoined in the moment of of commiserating and mourning. He's crying. He, he couldn't get here, but now he's here and he's expressing his emotions. He's weeping over the casket. Oh, what a, what a wonderful minister. But why in the world would you weep if you know you're about to get him up out of the grave? That doesn't make any sense. I think he was weeping because he had told all the people who needed to know who he was and what he was about to do. If only in allegorical form, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he is dead, will live. And nobody believed him. The doubt and the unbelief about who he was and what he was about to do was endemic. Everybody thought 
this was the end. And they put more faith in his ability to heal than his ability to raise from the dead. Are there little miracles and big miracles? Are there minimized miracles and maximized miracles? Is it harder for God to do one thing than another? Whether you heal or whether you raise from the dead. Jesus said it like this when a man who had been paralytic for a long time and, and, and his, his, his friends dropped him through a root because they couldn't get him into the house where Jesus was teaching. And Jesus saw their faith and said, oh boy, get up and walk. Your sins are forgiven. And, and, and the Pharisees, the religious people were there. They said, how can a man forgive sin? Only God can do that. He said, well, is it easier for me to say get up and walk than it is for me to say your sins are forgiven? Which miracle is harder? They thought he can only heal. He can't conquer death. All of that to say, long way around to the front door, I think Jesus was crying because all these people have been, this had been three years of ministry. He had six months before he was going to go to the cross. The faith level ought to be high. All the miracles he had done, feeding 5,000 and feeding 4,000, taking people who had been paralytic or quadriplegic for the last 15 or 20 years of their entire life and making them walk, opening blind eyes up, stopping deaf ears, miracles every place he went. And here they, he even raised people from the dead already. Jairus' daughter died. He raised her from the dead. Everybody ought to have their faith energized. Oh, what is he going to do now? Woo, he's here. Yes, sir. This is going to be a big one right here, baby. Get, 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 out, your, get out your video camera. Take out your iPhones. You want to record this one. Grab it. G-R-A-M. Instagram. 9 a.m. I'm sorry, 9 a.m. The, 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 the 11 will get it. TikTok it. This is going to be amazing. No faith. Zero. Everybody was thinking, done. That's why I think he was crying. I've been with these people three, three years, and they still don't get me. <laughs> I want them to enjoin in this miracle. I want them to, to participate, and they're just going to be spectators. Even my disciples don't get me. Wow. Father... I know you always hear me, but I'm going to speak like this loud enough so that they know I'm talking to you and that you hear me. Do something great here. That's Brett, Brett's paraphrase. Do something great here. And then he says, Lazarus, come forth. Now, I heard a preacher say on this passage once that he had to say Lazarus because they were at a grave site, which was actually a cemetery. There were a lot of sepulchers all along there. And if you had a sepulcher, you were wealthy. So this was a, a, a place that was decorated beautifully, much like we have our cemeteries. There were flowers every place. There, there were a lot of places where people had passed. If you didn't say Lazarus, the entire cemetery would have come together. Wow. Everybody would have come out. So, I, no, no, I mean, y'all need to stay there. You, 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 but Lazarus, you come out. Wow. <laughs> All the people were thinking, oh. I mean, they were already mad that they had to move the stone away because they said, Lord, it's been four days. He stinks. I mean, the body's decayed. This is ter you don't, don't tell us to move the stone away. That's just, are you kidding? And why in the world was it important to move the stone away? Well, if you didn't, he'd be alive on the inside and nobody'd know. He, he's supposed to come out and live with you. And this is, this is kind of the, the administration of resurrection is that when you receive Christ, when you come into a relationship with him, you get born again. You are risen from the dead. 
Who you were is not who you are anymore. Oh, people look at you the same. You still shave the same. Your hair does the same. Ain't nothing changed about all that. But you on the inside are different. You're not just reformed. You're not better. It's not just a new version of you. You are brand new. The old person died. The new person is alive. I'm letting you know. Now, your habits might betray you to think that that's not true. Your patterns might lie to you and say, no, you're the same old person. No, no, no. You have to learn new ways of doing things. But that doesn't change the reality of how you have been recreated in God. Yes, sir. You are brand new. And the beauty is that brand newness allows for God to do things that you've never done in your life before, for, for you to hear things you've never heard before, and for you to be something you've never been before. I have a brother and a sister. They're both younger. I'm the eldest. And when I got right with God, I was a nut. I just did everything radical. I preached out on campus in the open air. Students were walking by. I wanted everybody to know the truth. And I wasn't caustic. I wasn't mean. I was very conversational like I am right now. And I'd start off with something like, are there any absolutes? And I'd just keep saying it until somebody talked to me. Are there any absolutes? And then finally, one person who was a, a sociology major with a little bit of psychology and some philosophy, would say, no, there are no absolutes. I say, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> because you just made an absolute saying there is no absolute. And what gives you the right? Who are you that you can actually make an absolute that says there are no absolutes? Come on. Were you from the beginning? Do you know the end? How can you do that? But I do know somebody who is qualified. And then we begin a dialogue about who God is. Yeah. That's how I do it. And people would get right with God after about 25, 30 minutes. There'd be a crowd that would want to hear the bantering going back and forth. It was a lot of fun. I was crazy. I was nuts. But it was great. And I got, that's how I cut my teeth. And that's why I'm here 43 years later. Because all I want to do is preach the gospel. And in the process of preaching this message, I realized not only do I have to communicate truth, I've got to help people understand how they can communicate truth. And so my job now is not just talking to you. My job is removing stones, impediments to people's presentation of who they are so that other people can understand how in the world they have changed. We remove the stone of, 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 of impossible circumstances with respect to finances for them to come. It's expensive to plant a church. And we give somewhere in the neighborhood of $250,000, if not more, for a church plant. There was a stone in the way that didn't allow the presentation of this man and his woman and the people that were coming to be that which people could hear. We said, we're going to take that away for you. Our job as people is to make sure that we allow those who are with us to have an opportunity without impediment and, obst and obstruction to present who they are. And so Jesus said, you all roll the stone away. This is part of our process. And they rolled it away reluctantly because they didn't think, they just thought, you're letting the aroma out. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> Lazarus, come forth. And I'm convinced that there was a long time. I've been to Jerusalem, and I've seen some tombs. Tombs are different than graves. We do graves for the most part. And there are sepulchers in America. Those are those big buildings that you'll find in a graveyard where somebody spent $50,000 in order to make sure that their loved one was remembered well. They're going to put me in a box. <laughs> I don't care about any of that stuff. It's going to put me six feet under and I'll push up daisies. I'm good. But sepulchers are large. And I've been on the inside of them. And when they're carved into a mountain, you walk in and you have to bend down. And, you know, not, when I say large, you're not, not talking 20 by 20, but you're talking maybe 15 by 10. That's a little room. And so there's a, there's a slab upon which the, the, the deceased is placed. And when the deceased is placed there, the people who have cared for the body after the passing have gone through the mummification process where spices and wrappings and linens were placed around them to preserve the body because they believed in some kind of life after death. So it's just not Egypt that did that. Israel did that. The Jews did this. 
And so he was laid on a slab, concrete, stone slab. They didn't have concrete, stone slab. And with, with stuff all over, wrapped up like a mummy. And Jesus said, come forth. Come on. We're going to do a reenactment as best we know how to let you know the difficulty that Lazarus must have had in coming forth. It would take probably a day or so for the women who were a part of the process, women who were a part of the process of the mummification to do what they needed to do. And that kind of, 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 of process was detailed and they would, yeah, yeah keep going, keep going. Now, it, it, yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. You, you, you can take it, you're going to run out of stuff. Go, go down here. Yeah, 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 yeah. And make sure you get my legs too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got a lot. That's great. That's great. Okay. And so they would take great care and it would take hours upon hours to make sure the body was preserved. Spices, myrrh, frankincense, things that would allow for the decaying process to not go as quickly as it normally would. That's good here. Just start with the legs now. <laughs> you can just do the legs, Andrew. I'm going to get everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I want to, but, but it's going to take you 25 minutes to get it off me. <laughs> okay, that's good enough. Thank you. No, no, no take, cut it, cut it, cut it. And make sure it wrapped on. And then put it, tuck it in, tight. All right, so. Okay, what I want you all to do is play along with me. Be the voice of God and say, Lazarus, come forth. Still dead? No, I ain't dead. I'm alive. Oh, was that Je was that Jesus? Wow. What in the world? Where where am I? Oh, he said, "Come forth." Does he know what I'm in? Does he understand I can't come forth? How am I supposed to come forth? I gotta obey. I got. But how can I? Okay, 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 okay Lord, I'm coming. Doing the, I'm doing the best, doing the best I can, Lord. Doing, uh, uh, I'm coming, Jesus. Just give me a minute. Give me a minute. Uh, 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 uh. Woo! Okay. Wait a minute. Here I come. Here I come. Here I come. Here I come. Yeah. Took a lot of effort for that man to try to figure out how in the world to get from the slab to the entrance of the tomb. When you're raised, you have new life, but you don't know how to walk. Come on. Could you take my glasses? They're about to fall off my face. Thank you. <laughs> you don't know how to walk. You're bound. You don't know how you should be. You don't know how to live with people. You don't know how to give. You don't know how to think. You're bound. The grave clothes have yet to be removed, but you're alive. Yeah. And this is the come to moment. He told him to come out, but the come to is, he said, hey, y'all who are close by, take this stuff off them. This is why you need people around you. And this is the intimidating part. This is the scary part. People have to be in your life if you really want to get to where you need to be come on, faster. Come on. Come on. If you want to walk around like this all the days of your life and call yourself a Christian, God will let you. He'll let you. You won't progress much in the world, but you'll go to heaven. 
But there is a walking and a freedom that allows you to be what God has called you to be that can only be supplied by the people who are close to you who can take all this mess off. Are you listening to me? And then at some point, like I just did, when you see others begin to do you say, get off. Get. I don't want that anymore. I can in prayer deliver myself by, by the grace of God. And when you come out, Jesus calls you to come too, to people who can help. I can, I've been walking with him for 43 years, and I'm still coming too. I was on the phone this morning with a friend of mine saying, help me. I can't get this thing out of my brain. I can't walk as well as I should. Help me. Wow. Realizing that the power of people in my life helps me get delivered quicker. This is the beauty of being a part of a church. People say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Organized religion is what I don't like. You don't like other people's organized religion. You love the one you've created for yourself. Because it's organized. It's in your brain the way you want it to be. It's organized. But you don't know the scriptures well enough to organize it properly. Your architecture is limited. And so though you might love God, you may not do much for him here. You'll make it to heaven, but you won't bring heaven here. And the prayer that has been prayed so often in the body of Christ that Jesus taught the disciples, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Where? Thy kingdom come on earth as it is. How? As it is in heaven. God wants us to get to heaven, and for that I'm grateful. Because it's going to be so much better than here. But before I get there, my job is to bring heaven here. To bring the kingdom here. That when people walk in my house, they experience kingdom, not the world. When they walk in my church, they experience an expression of the kingdom because the church is supposed to be the greatest concentration of kingdom truth in the earth. That's what the church is supposed to be. You can have the kingdom represented in a small group, in a campus ministry, in a household. But not everything that is church is represented in, in any of those. The church is to be the organization where the uncompromising truth and all of the insight of God is concentrated in one spot. So you can grow the fastest and get the most. And the church is made up of people who aren't perfect and will hurt you. Yes. Yes. But you got to have an attitude like Noah. They won't try to hurt you. They just will because they're human. And by the way, you're a part of those people who will hurt people. There's nobody who won't hurt somebody else. I know you're looking at somebody saying, that person, mm, stay away from. Mm. But you don't know how many people are saying that about you. So how do we work in this imperfect environment? We have to be like Noah. Noah was called to build the ark. And we've romanticized the ark as this beautiful little boat. Big boat, little boat that had all these wonderful animals that were his pets. And they were enjoying life for nine months in a boat. Have you ever been, Kansas City has a zoo, and, and there's, a, there's a building in there called the Ape House. It's contained. You have to go through a door and then go out a door to exit to get in the Ape House. And the thing that hits you as you open the door from the Ape House, <laughs> y'all know, I, I, I ain't got to say it. Woo! And the interaction with the apes is not enough to, in, to discourage you from walking through there as fast as you possibly can because the stench is unbearable. Now, that's a five-minute visit. Try nine months. 
Among the many questions I will ask Noah when I get to heaven is, did you bring a shovel? <laughs> did you bring a shovel? And the only thing that kept Noah in that ark was that it, it was worse outside. It's worse outside, y'all. It's worse outside. I know the church isn't perfect, but these people will help you get unwrapped. They will help you get free. And in the process, you'll probably find a reason to be offended, yes. And you will give reason for offense. But it's better in here than it is out there. And there are only two options. There are only two options. Come to. And then lastly, go to. Unbind him and let him go. It wasn't just unbind him. It was unbind him and let him. Do you know that the people in Jerusalem who knew Lazarus was dead were now, after his resurrection, trying to kill him? Because he was the evidence that Jesus was real. And, and in my brain, I'm thinking this. Jesus raised him once. <laughs> if you kill him, like so, <laughs> sin makes you stupid. Sin makes you stupid. You make decisions that don't make any sense at all. But they were trying to kill Lazarus because Lazarus was evidence of Jesus' power and, and verification. Why? Because he was going to. <laughs> Unbind him and let him go. Lazarus, I got six months before I go to the cross. Give people a picture of what's going to happen to me. Let them see. Let them touch you and feel you. This isn't a phantom. It isn't a ghost. You were dead, and now you are alive. You are the picture of what's going to happen to me when this temple is destroyed, and in three days I'll raise it. Go. Your responsibility, once you're unbound, is to get out there and tell people so they can evidence the fact that Jesus Christ is real. Your life has changed. You were once dead. Now you are alive. I'm done. Come out. Come to and go. Father, I'm asking for your grace that you would empower us as a people. Give us the wisdom to know how to live best and help us to submit our souls to the fullness of your word so that we are free to give generously to your kingdom. We are free to, to be released from lust. We are free from selfishness we are free from idolatry we're not going to serve any other God you are it you are it what you say we will do free us and bind us so that we can be a people that can represent you well in the earth 